Bentley here. Good evening to you. On behalf of the Calgary Climate Hub, I welcome you to a climate of change. Our live cast feature exploring with thought leaders from across Canada what these wildly unprecedented times mean for addressing the climate crisis here in Alberta and how to create the impactful change we need. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pakani, the Tutsina, the Yaxi Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nations of Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'd like to also make a second land acknowledgement on behalf of another group of folks that have a stake in this land and that we stand on today, and that is our children, our nieces and nephews and grandchildren, and all future generations. I urge you to keep them, keep them in mind during this time as we face unprecedented change and start making decisions about what comes next. Our guest tonight is Jason Ribeiro, former Director of Strategy for Calgary Economic Development and outgoing curator for Global Shapers Calgary. As we head into the City of Calgary's Climate Symposium one month from now, as well as at least one and possibly two elections over the next year, what better time to talk to somebody that understands strategy, knows this city, and realizes a transition is coming whether we like it or not. Jason Ribeiro, welcome to A Climate of Change. Thanks, Bentley. Appreciate the, uh, the invitation and all the work uh, that uh, the Calgary Climate Hub uh, has done over the years. And, you know, we've partnered on uh, events in the past uh, through Global Shapers uh, Calgary. So appreciate the partnership and appreciate the invitation. Right on. Okay. So um, one of the things we like to do on this show is, is pan back and uh, try to make sure that we're seeing some of the large global events through the proper climate lens that the moment requires. Um, and uh, what, what I like to ask is, you know, when that first lockdown came, there was a lot of people that were just in their own space and, and looking out the window and couldn't go anywhere and couldn't see people, uh, you know, at least in, in physically. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, what, what sort of moment, what, what do you think the teachable moment is from that time for, for this, uh, specifically uh, Calgarians? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, I've enjoyed uh, hearing some of your previous guests uh, tackle it in episodes past. You know, before, before I can even get to, to lessons learned, because there are several, I'm sure we'll get into a few of them uh, throughout the course of our conversation. I really think it's important we hone in on how unprecedented uh, COVID-19 and the subsequent uh, response restrictions and lockdowns have been, uh, if you'll indul indulge me for a moment. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're approaching the, the one year mark uh, on March 15th of the declaration of the state of local emergency uh, here in Calgary due to the pandemic. And while so many of the features of uh, bubble life have become kind of rote, uh, including the Zoom we find ourselves in uh, on tonight, um, we can't lose sight of just how historic this is. You know, for folks that have lived in other countries or dealt with health crises uh, before at a pandemic level, uh, many of them might have experienced brief or sustained lockdowns. But in the Canadian context, this is really unrivaled and, and new. Anything remotely similar occurred in the First World War, Second World War, and briefly uh, in uh, 1970 during the October crisis in Montreal. Uh, other than that, there's been nothing since. So that's not to say that, that we haven't seen different types of, of crises before. We've seen you know, fiscal crises that may have prepared us for, for some of this. You know, in Alberta, we have you know, volatility and resiliency essentially coded into our DNA. Uh, due to the up and down performance of our, of our energy sector. We've seen natural disasters. Out of the 10 most costly Canadian natural disasters in history, seven out of 10 have been in Alberta and all yeah. seven of them have been in the last decade. Right. Um, but, but that experience that you talked about of being restricted or cooped up for our own safety and for this long of a period of time is, is extraordinary. And while we've shown that after disaster or crises past that we can bounce back, that our can-do spirit, our ingenuity and resilience uh, is unrelenting, I worry uh, truly about how hardened these past crises may have made us. And I fear that some of our pick ourselves up mentality and dust our shoulders off uh, tough exterior, which is admirable and something that I definitely relate to. I worry sometimes that it may not allow us to, to connect some, some really important dots um, you know, that being first, if, if we were to just close our eyes for a second and sit with the pain of experiencing unrelenting unemployment or precarious work or being restricted from leaving our homes to see loved ones who are, are ill or isolated, um, 
or, or the pain of mourning with nearly uh, the families of nearly 1900 Albertans uh, who have died during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And if we took that time to sit and close our eyes and understood that A, it is likely that in our lifetimes, we find ourselves right back here in our homes in lockdown uh, as, as, a, as a near certainty, and B, that it may be due to another health crisis, certainly, but it also may be very well due to a climate-related crisis. If we could acknowledge that possibility and, and potentially that reality, I fundamentally we would uh, believe we'd be having a more fruitful, engaging, and productive dialogue. You know, we could think of Think about a climate-related lockdown, which forced governments to restrict private vehicles or uh, individual or industrial CO2 emitting practices, not just mm -hmm. limit or draw them down, but ban them outright. You know, we think that we're deploying a lot of fiscal horsepower now. Imagine what we would need to deploy later on in a climate-related uh, lockdown. So for me, this is no longer theoretical. The evidence is in the ashes of people's homes in California, in frozen pipes, in Texas, in dented right. vehicles in Northeast Calgary. Um, so, so that's a long-winded way of saying, yes, I've seen some, some lessons learned, some teachable moments, but I'm worried still mm -hmm. about whether we're employing all of the knowledge, all of the creativity and the credibility that we desperately need to show that we can learn our way forward through this crisis and not let our response to this one or the next one or the one after that uh, be more the same, uh, or just you know the equivalent of playing Groundhog Day on on loop. So I'll 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 leave it there as sort of my overview of of what the teachable moment and lesson learned have been. Yeah, um, you know you you mentioned Texas, and uh, you know I, I I started asking the question about specifically about COVID, but when when the insurrection happened on January six, I see things through a climate lens, so I can relate that I can relate how that happened to climate, and then. Um, you know, things like the Texas grid, I think there, something's happening there that like nobody's really talking about the fact that during the COVID pandemic, that disaster happened. And so, you know, it, it's like the new normal is whatever else happens in the world from insurrections to pandemics to energy grids failing, you've, you've always got this background of climate crisis. And, uh, you know, so that that requires a lot of resilience uh, from a city and its people. And uh, I think you're right to be concerned about that. Um, I, I guess, you know, with you being, a, uh, I, I, you have one of the a really meaty title, you know, former director of strategy for Calgary Economic Development. To me, that's, 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 a, that's a decent title to be able to carry around in your life. And so kudos for that. But um, let, me, let me put you on the spot here and say that, uh, you know, you walk into a room, Trudeau's there, the head of the, the province is there, our mayor's there, and they say, Jason, what's, you're, you're, a, you're a strategic director. What do you think our strategy should be for the next 10 years to sort of get through this pandemic and to, uh, to address some of these, these global challenges that the whole world is, is staring down? You're, uh, you're putting me in the driver's seat here, you know, careful what you, uh, careful what <laughs> you wish it. for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I appreciate those kind words. Look, you know, why don't I start with the, the sort of lay of the land that would sort of broach that conversation with those decision makers and, and then kind of outline the perspective I hold that, that would shape those recommendations. And then we can see how the, the specific recommendations play out. Um, you know, the first thing, and I think you've, you've acknowledged it in the framing of the question, is we have to recognize that this simply can't be done. Uh, and by this, I mean a, a sort of just transition, a just recovery, uh, navigating a climate and public health crisis at, at the same time, as well with a number of other uh, crises, an affordable housing crisis, a homelessness challenge, uh, the reckoning on, on uh, racial inequities uh, that we've been facing. So uh, in my opinion, many of these can't be done simply at a city level. Uh, we have too many people, particularly when we think about uh, a just transition or a just recovery, we have too many people on the, on the servicing and downstream side uh, in our city, and our efforts would be disconnected from the efforts of those working upstream or on rigs uh, in extraction elsewhere in, in Alberta. Um, you know, furthermore, the city doesn't have you know, the authority or fiscal horsepower to, to pull this off. So anything related to, to recovery, to transition, et cetera, would need to be approached across all three orders of government as, as you alluded to. And I think that's really important. 
I, I also want to acknowledge because it was implicit in the in the portion you, you discussed about Texas, is that we're we're in a similar position. Our economic recovery right now is uneven and uncertain because of the double whammy of the pandemic and low commodity prices. And that's over top of a layer of sustained joblessness and economic downturn over a number of, of years. So, you know, the first challenge that we have to confront is that in an environment, in an environment like that, it's not surprising to me uh, that many are skeptical about some of the proposed solutions or responses to, to climate change or public health, you know, the, the, or the notion of transitioning our economy or even some of the rhetoric that's emerging from other parts of the world uh, about our province. And I think that's confirmed by most of the polling I've seen in Alberta and jurisdictions like it, particularly in Atlantic Canada. So I wanna just acknowledge that I see a through line there. I, I understand it to a degree. Um, uh, and I think it's important to acknowledge. Now, the, the perspectives that would shape my opinion going into that room, first of all, I'm flattered that I've been given in some weird scenario that kind of uh, authority. There's, <laughs> there's so many other people that are much smarter than me that I'm interested in, uh, you know, Dr. Blake Schaefer, Martha, Martha Hall Finley, so many others that I think you should have on this program, but I digress, I'm in the driver's seat. The first is, you know, I'm walking in with lived experience. You know, I, I grew up in a, in a General Motors family with both my uh, parents employed on the service side of the automotive industry in Ontario. Both were immigrants. Uh, both were, uh, had very little formally recognized uh, education. Both went on to be quite successful. But I still remember the very visceral feeling uh, of fear, of trepidation, of anger, and hastened planning that enveloped our home in 2009 when GM filed for Chapter 11. Uh, so I have a deep amount of, of compassion for people whose jobs and livelihoods are at the forefront of this conversation. Um, the second one is more of a, a philosophical uh, approach, which is that it's actually articulated really well in a book that uh, I'll, I'll plug because it's, it's thought for provoking um, called Gardeners versus Designers. And it's written by Dr. Brian Lee Crowley, who's the head of the McDonald uh, Laurier Institute. And he's a right leaning economist. Um, and he said that, you know, there are two types of buckets of political leaders, ones that are designers who think that they can fix things from on high on top down uh, and others that recognize just how far we've, we've built this country, uh, built this, this world with ingenuity and innovation, uh, recognizing that there are things that need to be improved, but abandoning it to build something entirely new is, is, is oftentimes a little bit hubristic. And we have to be very cautious of over-promising and under-delivering. Um, uh, and so, you know, his approach is one of a, less of a designer, but more of a gardener. And I think I adopt that approach. I don't think he brings it all the way home in that book. I disagree vehemently with a lot of the book, but I think that gardener versus designer mentality is really, really important. So I'm, I'm in the room now. The first thing that I think we need to do um, uh, is, is draw from lessons uh, from the past. Uh, and that's more the gardener's approach, taking the incremental sort of tweaked based approach of what's worked. And I think we have a lot to learn from the task force on just transition for Canadian coal power workers and communities. You know, federally commissioned body um, has delivered some thoughtful reports, has led to uh, a number of uh, investments from the federal government leveraged from other orders uh, of government and the private sector. I think that's really important. So the three lessons I learned from, from that and, and others around the world are number one, you have to consult. If you're embarking on some 10 year vision to do anything, you have to meaningfully consult with people. I have yet to see uh, both upstream and downstream as it concerns the just transition or a just recovery, the kind of consultation we need to really be able to have that conversation meaningfully about any policy that would need to be deployed. Secondly, I really think that we have to uh, think about who is having that conversation. Oftentimes when it's approached, particularly from a partisan lens, you only get so far. So having a, a commission that has representation from across the board, I think is, is supremely important. And, and third, we have to recognize that this is going to take capital. If this is about well wishes and, you know, you know some small incentives for reskilling and retraining that may not pan out, uh, this is not gonna work. So this is going to need the fiscal house horsepower of all orders of government. It's gonna need fiscal, uh, horsepower from the private sector and a lot of ingenuity across the board to really be able to deploy uh, what's going to get us uh, out of this. And, you know, the example I look at is, is from the United States. You know, I remember when President Obama was addressing coal communities 
And at the beginning, his rhetoric was really around, you're going to get new skills and new jobs in, in data fields and technology, et cetera. I look at some of those counties where coal plants were, were closed down. Many of them had courses that were undersubscribed or had to close down. Uh, many of them who went through the training didn't have uh, the skill sets that were required to actually compete in the tech, tech driven economy. And then by the end of his tenure, and this is someone I, I have a great amount of respect for, had to acknowledge that, hey, some of these jobs are not, just not going to come back. That's the kind of level setting and honest brokering we need to have conversations about wage insurance, about fiscal bridges to retirement, about retraining and reskilling, uh, taking with, uh, from what works and, and not over-promising things that, that may not deliver. So maybe my approach is, is overly humble, but I do think that would be a very bold approach, one that I've not seen deployed in Alberta to be able to navigate what a just transition might look like. Are there some policies that really step out to or, or, or stick out to you that you feel like are, are kind of a no-brainer for, for specifically for Calgary? Uh, yes, uh, fundamentally, I think that the two that I briefly mentioned, particularly on the labor side, because we have to we have to keep in mind um, as we've dealt with the sustained unemployment and and job losses, we're actually now entering a very tight labor market uh, in relation to, to oil and uh, oil and gas. Right. Uh, there are there are shortages on on rigs. There's there's shortages. Uh, in some of the more traditional uh, industries um, uh, currently right now. So you have to compete with that, those that are hiring. And we also have to compete with a little bit of the double whammy of what the, the primary trade here is in Calgary and Alberta. Uh, for engineers, you know, the double whammy for us is that the half-life of an engineer's skills are some of the most rapidly changing of all uh, roles that you could imagine. You know, the half-life I think is now around three to three and a half years for the average engineer. And of course that vacillates on what side of the engineering spectrum uh, you're on, but that's incredibly, uh, incredibly short shelf life for some of these skills. So I think that the, the two that I'm most intrigued by, uh, particularly for those that are older workers are, are wage insurance and um, uh, fiscal bridges to retirement. So wage insurance is basically to say, look, you know, for companies and sectors that are really being hard hit by either the public health pandemic or policy changes related to climate or even just market changes, depending on the temperament or uh, affinity of the government to do so, to be able to offer wage insurance to say, hey, if you're downsized, um, uh, or I should say moved to a role within a company that lowers your salary uh, from X amount to Y amount, you know, the government will make up that difference to be able to keep you on the payroll there so that you can keep your job. Uh, I, I, I have yet to see that meaningfully deployed. And I think that that would be uh, a, a really great way for uh, some of the employers to carry a, a lot of people forward as we transition versus just cutting, uh, cutting them off and, and putting them onto unemployment, uh, especially because it's very hard to translate some of these skills. Some of them are transferable, but others not. And then the others for, for folks that are you know, in the later stages of their career, who will not have a great chance at going back to school or not a ton of incentive to get reskilled or upskilled. And by the way, those are things that I, I believe in. I'm, uh, you know, my background from a research perspective on the doctoral side is around cross-sector partnerships and education and, and training. I'm a former K-12 teacher, but I also pragmatically realized that someone at 60 years old who had planned to work for the next five years uh, may not be so amenable to going back to school and entering into a new workforce. The ability to be able to give them a fiscal bridge to retirement, to see them off, to make sure that they're secure and, and ensure that they don't end up in, in fiscal isolation and social isolation, I think are two very, very big low hanging fruit opportunities we can deploy. Yeah. Um, okay. So how, how how much do, do the do Calgary's next wave of business leaders see a transition coming and, you know, will they remain here if our city and our province doesn't embrace it? You know, as, as you know, we are losing young people at a rapid rate from this province. Uh, and I think you're in, a, in, a, in a, an interesting position there, given, you know, your place in, in, in having done work with Calgary Economic Development, as well as, uh, Global Shapers Calgary with these these young professionals that are, you know, looking to the horizon kind of thing. And uh, I guess the first first of all, how common a thought is it amongst young professionals that geez, we've got we've got some big changes coming, or we better have big changes coming, or I'm going to bring my family someplace else. 
Yeah, you know, and and you know, speaking for someone who's who's sort of uh, in that category, I'm 31 and with a young family. Um, I, I have not met a serious business leader um, uh, within my age range uh, that does not see what's coming around the corner, uh, does not recognize the moment that we find ourselves in. Um, and, and frankly, that's not just, you know, specific to, you know, sort of next gen young professionals or business leaders. There are many really astounding mentors that I have, many who work in the uh, energy sector or, or in corporate or nonprofit work, all recognize um, uh, what's happening right now in this province. So I don't want to put it as sort of these, these next gen of business leaders are going to be the saviors. All of them recognize it. I think many just disagree on, on some of the, the, the changes going forward. And look, you know, when I, I served as a director of strategy um, uh, in 2019 and 2020, I, I left at the end of the year um, to take a full year of, of paternity leave, which I'm in right now, and to, and to finish my, my doctoral uh, research. But over that period of time, I met business leaders across every sector. I worked hand in glove with many of them to bring investments to the city, to deploy new research, new thinking. Um, the, the question really is around uh, uh, the, the statistic you referenced around young people, because it's, it's, it's drawing a lot of attention right now. I do think it's a concern, but it is one that we have to, I think, really you know, pour through the data to understand how we want to respond to it. You know, young people and interprovincial migration, have, it's, it's always been occurring uh, throughout Calgary and Alberta's history. We've, we've seen an outflow of a ton of people. We've seen a, an influx of a ton of people. But young people have steadily, in the data that we poured back through while I was leading the research and strategy team at, at CED, you know, we saw that trend for years and years and years where Calgary actually punched above its weight was in bringing people back in their prime working years, in their early 30s when they wanted to have a family, when they wanted to buy an affordable home, uh, when they wanted a low cost of living. We've always had the ability to pull people back. So I think that, yes, we need to be concerned about young people not necessarily seeing a future in their own backyard. I think any city, any province should be worried about that. But I also think we have to have our eyes you know, squarely trained towards not losing people who want to start their family, who want to invest the next 15 to 20 years, want to deploy their capital and deploy their, their, their tax base here in this province, making sure we're not losing those people as well, because that I think will ultimately be a death blow, not necessarily folks who go around the world, go to, you know, take internships in, in fantastic places across the world, uh, go to school in different jurisdictions, and then come back when they're ready because Calgary and Alberta is home. Uh, I think we're only benefiting from them going out and having that experience. You know, I moved here when I was 25 to do my PhD, and I didn't know a single person here. Calgary kept me here. Uh, so I'm not as concerned about that as, 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 uh, as some are. So, you know, you, uh, being a, a, a young business-minded guy and, and, uh, and with the experience that you've got, does, does capitalism as it stand have what it takes to, to help us, to get us where we got to go on climate crisis? The climate crisis is just such an enormous thing. And, um, you know, I, I, whenever I speak with a business person about it, I mean, the, the question that I have is, is how strong a role can business have in it? And, and you know, why hasn't, why hasn't it stepped up so far? And, um, you know, I mean, I guess we've sort of, we've had about 20 years to innovate our way out of this thing. And, you know, I, I, I wonder about, you know, if the prime motivation is to return investment to a shareholder and not get us to uh, zero as fast as we can, then I feel like we're going to lose that race. Um, how strong a role does business have to have? How much of it has to be government in your, in your opinion? Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's a really, really good question. Um, and, you I know, it's really good questions, man. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just throw that plug in there. No, it's, it's yeah. a good question. Look, and it's, it's actually one I've wrestled with quite a bit. Uh, I think all would agree um, what we have right now and what we've, we've had is, is imperfect um, and is in, in need of in, uh, uh, improvement uh, dating back years. Uh, there's also a lot of brilliance that's emerged from the system as it stands. And, you know, so for me, in terms mm -hmm. of a philosophical camp about capitalism, you know, I, I, there's a, a brilliant economist um, uh, by the name of Mazzucato, 
um, who, who has really talked about um, reshaping, tweaking capitalism, but still existing within the capitalist framework around redefining value and redefining the traditional levers of how we deploy and create and shape value. And you know, where I'm aligned with her, and, and you know, there was an event at the University of Calgary uh, several months ago where she presented uh, some of the findings of her new book that are coming out. And you know, I was included on an expert panel to dissect some of these ideas and how they could apply to Alberta. I think you're quite right. The first thing that we need to eliminate from some of the business, political, and investment thinking right now is, is short-termism. Um, it's not how I think, it's not what's gonna get us out of it. It's ultimately what has sort of beleaguered the response to some of the climate crisis and a lot of other investment crises uh, that we've seen over time um, is this short-term thinking. You know, All of these uh, challenges that lead to job losses are not the automatic consequence of, of sort of climate policies uh, that are being made right now. They're the consequence of lagging investment over time, social policies, and like you've said, anticipation, which we've, we've had a good eye on for some time. Um, to your point though, about what, is, what do those tweaks look like? I, I, I'm, of, I'm of two minds where that's concerned. One is those tweaks are being made. The question is whether they're correlated and amalgamated into a way where we can grasp our hands on it. For those that believe in a a green new deal or a just transition or a great reset, or you can insert some of these big movements here, some which are reduced to hashtags, some which are actually really solid policy planks. A lot of what we're seeing is, is happening right now. It's just not being branded with the, the banner of being the green new deal. The federal budget that has come out over years in subsequent governments of either stripe has always you know, included some measures of energy efficiency, retrofits. Uh, they've been uh, extended right now in the most recent budget that's taken a, a square focus on net zero. But many of those things are, are what people have been asking for in the climate community for years. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, uh, oil well cleanup, um, you know, methane gas capture, funding for some of the decarbonization initiatives, even the province over a period of time. And this government and the previous government have, have done that. It's, it's just not being bundled up in the, in the conversation of a Green New Deal or a just transition. When any sort of climate report that I've read has talked about those being really surefire safe bets to, to reduce emissions. So I think we have to recognize what we are doing and maintain those. And then the other side is really uh, adopting, I think, robust ESG frameworks. That is what I've been, I've been uh, uh, sort of disheartened by. I haven't seen a lot of the corporate community uh, really tackle those head on. I'm, I'm heartened by some of the momentum I see happening now, but I think ultimately uh, we have the, the opportunity to really get our hands around what an ESG framework looks like and hold, uh, uh, the, have the corporate leaders in this community hold each other accountable to what that, uh, what that entails across all three of those domains practice what we preach, and then we will live up to the expectations and some of the bravado we hold, I think, uh, across the world about Alberta being a place for, for clean prosperity and, and good jobs that respect the dignity of people and the environment, for sure, 100%. Um, yeah, so just to follow up on that, um, I, I, I also have a chance to plug a, a partner organization uh, is, is, that does some great work is... Uh, uh, Open Street Events and uh, the Arusha Center are holding uh, tomorrow night a screening of the new corporation, uh, and that sort of ties into some of the some of my concerns. Um, is is that well? First of all, I should say it's tomorrow night at six p.m. and I think we're going to have a link in the uh, the chat here. So anybody who wants to go and check that out, it's a screening of that documentary, and you may be familiar with the original the corporation documentary. Uh, this is the sequel and we, they will have the directors on hand to answer questions. So it's gonna be a, a great event. But uh, you know, one of the things that the new corporation identifies is that you know, corporations, a lot of them still think very much along the lines of, it's all about making as much money for that table full of guys and it's typically white guys and, and old guys, if it's in North America. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the corporations get good at saying the sorts of things that are going to make people comfortable. But, you know, they, there ends up being, you know, you can call it greenwashing, you can call it whatever you like, but, you know, that is some, it is something that we have to be vigilant of. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I, my, I have a very real fear 
of Calgary getting left behind. I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I, I, this, this is my home. This is, this is, this is where I was born and, and I have loved ones here and, and I don't want to leave this place. And, uh, you know, but there is a very, I, I have a real, a very real fear of that. And, uh, you know, so I'm wondering, do you like, does do you share that concern? Uh, yes and no. I, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, the first thing I think we need to acknowledge is that being in, in Calgary, in this place, you know, we've, we've caught the brass ring. Uh, we're, we're incredibly fortunate and lucky to have the, the quality of life, uh, that we have in, in one of the greatest countries on earth. And so I'm, I'm a little reticent about, you know, us being left behind or, or comparisons to, to other jurisdictions and uh, Detroit, you know, we, we've, we balance our budget. We've got a healthy fiscal sheet. You know, we've, you know, our health outcomes are largely good. We've got a lot of things to improve. And I've been, you know, even prior to my role at CED, you know, was very outspoken either in, you know, political commentary on, on television or in, in community organizing about what we need to improve. We, we definitely uh, do. But I, I'm not worried about uh, being left behind solely because of the strength of uh, our people. Um, I had the privilege um, in, in leading the economic strategy uh, for Calgary uh, amongst a number of, of thoughtful stakeholders across business, nonprofits, et cetera. And the ingenuity that I'm, I'm seeing, um, not just within uh, specifically, say, clean tech, where, you know, I could point to a lot of things that, that don't sound like a place that's going to be left behind, you know, a hundred million dollar backstop clean resource innovation network, you know, for the most promising clean tech companies on the Narwhal list or in Calgary. Um, I, I could go down the list uh, across the board of all of the things that we have in our back pocket that, that people would, would uh, you know, uh, pine for in their communities. Where I see a challenge is, is in the lack of vision to tie all of these things together. I'm a, I'm a fan of big tent politics, uh, big tent community organizing. And I think it's that give and take that we've, we've, we've lost. Um, there's been a hyper-partisan backlash, I think, to uh, some of the isolation feelings within Alberta and Confederation. Some, some justifies, I think some, you know, ginned up and exacerbated for, uh, you know, sort of more devious purposes. Um, I think that's, that's hurt things. We also find ourselves within a macro uh, climate around politics and business that is incredibly black or white or, or partisan, and that is also challenging. Um, but this is, uh, you know, as, as my friend uh, Mary Moran says, a very opportunity rich place to be in. And I just see a ton of people in my circle uh, who I'm privileged to count as friends and colleagues working on incredible things in, in solar and in EVs, in, um, uh, even in, in oil and gas know-how in terms of methane emissions reductions, uh, in carbon utilization and capture and storage. Those are these safe bets commercially viable, widespread applicable solutions that the rest of the world and this province are gonna need and it's happening here. So it's more for me a concern of rhetoric. It's more a concern of thoughtful policy to avoid some of the whitewashing uh, and things that you've described uh, as highlighted in the documentary that's set to premiere. Um, that's within our control. Uh, these are solutions that can be solved. If we get left behind, is because we haven't taken uh, the right decisions or made the right choices, not because we weren't given a choice or not because we didn't have a decision to be made in front of us is my two cents on the subject. So you actually, you just you hearing you speak reminded me of a thread that I, uh, that I read of yours. I think it might've been a farewell thread to Calgary Economic Development, but you, you laid out a bunch of really cool businesses uh, doing interesting things uh, quite a lot on agriculture as well, and that's that's another thing where I feel like um, there's there's a lot of opportunity. What when we talk about a just transition for this province, you know, the 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 standard dichotomy is is like you know people that are working in oil and gas feel attacked by that, um, and uh, you know, and, and that's that's unfortunate, and and some of that is pro might is probably has to do with how we climate folks bring it up, but. Um, I, I've often felt like there's a number of reasons why Calgary and Alberta could lead the world on these new th things. Like somebody 
It's new stuff. Somebody has to lead it anyway. We have great education systems in here and great education institutions and a, a vibrant uh, STEM section. And, uh, you know, so as far as, as, as an Alberta just transition goes, what are some of the some of the technologies that you think there's a chance we could end up being a world leader on you know I, I think about one of the one of the easiest ones I think about or to me it sounds easy is is where there's a an oil uh, an, an oil well that's been orphaned and is appropriate for geothermal I mean we turn that into geothermal and then we should you know that should be something that we're that we're not only very good at but great at we're we're great at that stuff what what sorts of what sorts of things can Albertans be hopeful for uh, in a transition with our the natural bounties that we have for us in front of us? No, uh, absolutely, uh, an astute um, uh, sort of jumping off point. Um, you know, the the thread you're 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 referring to, uh, you know, sort of when I bid my my farewell into uh, into paternity leave was really about our, our city's economic strategy, which you know, uh, I, was, I was part of uh, collectively leading with the, with the community and a number of partners um, about making Calgary the destination of choice for the world's best entrepreneurs who wanna solve really big challenges in cleaner energy, safe and secure food, the efficient movement of goods and people and better health uh, solutions. And it was an incredible privilege and I got the opportunity uh, on, on social media and, and pinned to my Twitter profile, all of the different announcements, initiatives, successes uh, that happened all across the board, ac across our established uh, 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 sectors in energy and agribusiness and transportation and logistics, and in emerging sectors like uh, financial services and fintech, uh, all the way through to creative uh, industries and life sciences. So definitely, I think, check that out because it was a privilege to tell that story um, mm -hmm. be before I left. You know, he's pointed on, on two things. First, this notion of leading the world. I think it's important to, to note, uh, and, and this goes back to your previous question around a di dichotomy that might exist between some of the, uh, I think, established leaders in, in the business community and some of the, the folks that, that might see it a little bit differently, including myself. There are a ton of people that I respect that have, you know, extensive resumes, know-how, care about this community, who have... I've been across from in boardrooms, in, in boards and in community who have told me, you know, look, we believe that, you know, if there's going to be a last barrel of oil that is produced on this planet, it should be in Calgary and Alberta. And they, they make a, a compelling argument uh, for why. And I, I agree with it largely in terms of, you know, environmental protections, uh, democratic governments, all of the things that we, we know how, um, uh, you know, almost to, to, to rattle off uh, by memory. But I'm not interested in being the last to do anything. Right. I'm interested in being the first to right. do something. So yeah. uh, that's a fundamental uh, difference. So I'm concerned with where we can be the, the, the first. And, and to your point, those technologies are, are widely deployable across a number of sectors. So I really think that there's a lot that the energy sector would benefit from uh, across oil and gas all the way to, uh, to renewables. Uh, but that's also something to be weary of. Remember that digitiz uh, digitization and artificial intelligence and machine learning um, are, are sort of industry or sector agnostic. They will allow uh, energy producers and traditional oil and gas to extract and refine more efficiently um, uh, mm -hmm. with fewer people, uh, with more profits, et cetera, et cetera, just the same way that they become more commercially viable on the solar panel side and, and, uh, and likewise. So I think that's important to note, but in terms of you know, safe bets and, and sort of the wildcard bets. The Canadian Institute for Climate Choices released an incredible report. Uh, I think it was earlier this month. And I think, you know, some of them are the, the safe bets for what we can do with technology are unsexy. Um, they're electric vehicles, uh, yep. because again, widespread, uh, commercially viable, could be implemented tomorrow. And I think those are a little sexy. Those are a little, a little bit sexy. That's true, right? that's true. A uh, little bit, <laughs> depending on which EV, I guess. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, you know, there's, a, there's also a, a statistic today I read uh, from KPMG that said, in a poll of, of Canadians, 70% of Canadians are planning to make their next vehicle purchase an electric or hybrid vehicle. Right. And of those 70%, 60% of them are, making, are planning to make that purchase in the next three to five years. Now, yeah. Atlantic Canada and, and Alberta certainly lag those numbers, but it's still over 50%. 
So I think electric vehicles at a, at a consumer level are an incredible opportunity. I think energy efficiency retrofits, particularly within our downtown core uh, and our industrial sectors is, is a no brainer. Carbon capture storage, particularly in the high concentration side um, uh, uh, as well. And then, but th th we also need some wild cards. And I think that's where, you know, the geothermal conversations come up, the hydrogen conversations come up and even some of the uh, industrial decarbonization and land use stuff. Yeah. Um, if, if we have the, the foresight and the know-how and the thinking to really, uh, you know, walk through what l responsible land use planning might be, that might be a wild card to, to, to make a dent on emissions as well. But I think there are things we can definitely do uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, bolstered by technology that will certainly help. And isn't it incredible that we have the, have the lithium that could go for electric car batteries? You know, it's like yeah. we have, we, we, we have, we, this is, this province is a gift. If we, if we're, if we just need to shepherd it there, I, I think. Um, so, okay. What we're going to go to our panelists shortly. Uh, but before I do, I want to say a special thanks to the folks who help keep the lights on. Uh, so on behalf of the, I mean, the electric solar powered lights. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of Calgary Climate Hub, I'd like to take this moment to recognize the support of the Alberta Ecotrust Foundation, whose grant programs have helped bring forward so many great Alberta-specific environmental in uh, initiatives, including this broadcast. They're a group of very smart people that care about the right things, and in my humble opinion, they'll only become more and more important to this province as we do look at these transitions that we need to make. Um, I also want to say a few words uh, regarding the Calgary Climate Hub and our upcoming elections, or the upcoming elections of this province. Um, the Hub is a nonpartisan organization and we are not in the business of telling you who we think you should or should not vote for. We will, however, remind you that in 2021, every election is a climate election and that it's perfectly reasonable for the people asking for your vote to have an answer when you ask them for their climate plan. You can join the Calgary Climate Hub in making that ask by becoming a member and joining our elections node, uh, a core group of dedicated volunteers seeking to ensure that climate is a part of the debate and on the ballot. Uh, so you can check out our chat. In fact, a lot of the things we've talked about today uh, and, and every show, we, we try to include the links in the chat so you can get more details if you'd, uh, if you'd like it. And actually, uh, Jason, you'll, you'll dig this. I have a bit of a special announcement to make here uh, before we move on to the panelist section of our show. Um, a thousand years from now, when people are looking back on the historical timeline for the climate era, one of the names on that timeline will be Dr. Michael Lee Mann. In fact, I often say before there was an Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, there was Michael Lee Mann's hockey stick curve, um, which maybe some of you are familiar of, certainly from the climate world you are. Um, with no shade on Al Gore and the work that he did. Uh, I'm in awe of the fact that we have Dr. Mann lined up for our very next Climate of Change broadcast. And that will be part of the City of Calgary's Climate Symposium next month. Uh, special thanks and a shout out to Jim Byrne and our great new friends in the Southern Alberta Climate Hub, some of whom might be watching right now. And uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go out of my way to say welcome. Uh, coalition building is so important, especially in this province amongst common climate minds. So uh, welcome and let's see what great work we can, can continue to do together. Um, so that uh, Climate of Change featuring Dr. Michael E. Mann takes place at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, March 24th. And you can find the RSVP link in the chat. What do you think of that, Jason? Your follow-up interview, the guy after you is one of the, the, the biggest minds in climate history. How about that? How about that? And, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'll not, uh, maybe I won't uh, reveal this, online, but I, I think that uh, there's a fair uh, likelihood that uh, I will be following him in another venue, uh, in another conversation at an event in the next uh, few weeks as well. So definitely a, a great get and uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say. Right on. Uh, okay, so we have our panelists. I'm gonna go, my first panelist I'm gonna go to, uh, her name is Lori Farley of Intonovus Canada and Impact Calgary. And she does a lot of great work helping entrepreneurs embed social impact into their business models, which is why I thought she'd be a great panelist uh, for Jason. Uh, you know, she did, and, and that social impact most certainly includes sustainable development goal number 13, which is climate action. 
Um, I'm going to embarrass Lori a little bit, maybe, because uh, she's a great and smart lady. Um, if you enjoyed, uh, well, actually, what I'll say is that um, when I do that second land acknowledgement on behalf of the children and the grandchildren, etc., it was Lori's idea uh, who came to me one time and said, Steve, why don't you write something up like that? It's just, you, you should do it. And uh, I've got a lot of praise from a lot of folks all over the place. This is the lady who had the idea and she's got all sorts of ideas. So Lori, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Steve. Hi, Jason. Congratulations on your new family member. I've been meaning to tell you that for a while, but we don't get to see each other anymore. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, thanks for that discussion. So I know that you're really community minded and I really appreciate that. We're kind of in the same mindset in that space. And when we're talking about the new economy in Alberta, we're often referring to the energy sector or the tech sectors. And as we start talking about balancing and diversifying our economy, um, we know that everybody has a, a stake as consumers and business owners. <clears throat> and climate change is a part of a systematic, systematic set of issues that needs to be addressed in an integrated way and in integrated systems. And you know, I'm probably referring to this because I'm talking about all the sustainable development goals and how climate change fits into that. So for um, entrepreneurs that are concerned about climate change, uh, their business is just going to be a part of that whole integrated system. What's your take on some of the questions that entrepreneurs should be asking themselves and business owners, how their businesses can contribute or participate in changing those systems and how their businesses can contribute to making improvements that are needed in all of those systems to uh, resolve climate change. And I'm referring to all the different kinds of businesses that includes the energy sector and tech sector, but you know, the moccasin lady, the jewelry making lady, the coffee shop. I think that a climate conversation um, in Alberta needs to consider all the people that have been supporting the energy sector, but not in the energy sector for so many years. No, it's a it's a it's a great uh, great question, and thank you for uh, asking it. Look, it's it's one that I've I've uh, you know spent many a night thinking about as well. You know, we we tend to try and have the the biggest impact uh, as possible, and you know, over the last couple of years, what I've been trying to balance is you know where the where's the capital being deployed, uh, where are the most amount of employees that we can impact, while also balancing sort of my roots as a sort of community organizer on the ground uh, sort of person. And I think you're quite right that, that we need to really strike a middle ground, especially when many of the businesses are small businesses uh, that uh, are gonna be having to make, you know, a lot of tiny decisions um, that align themselves to, to being part of the new economy or um, a part of the solutions towards uh, some of the impacts of climate change. So I think there's, I'm of two, I'm, I have two thoughts. The first is, look, we have a ton of frameworks that can help. I know you've done a lot of work in, in sort of B Corp space, um, say sustainable development goals, ESG, but they have to be accessible. Um, if, if I'm just someone who, like you said, is, is, you know, selling moccasins that are homemade, et cetera, it's hard to, you know, relate to a framework that is being negotiated with member countries from some, you know, uh, macro international organization. How does that impact me? Part of what I've realized is that many of those folks have not been consulted with. So, you know, folks like, like you at, at Impact Calgary and other partners that are actually doing the work, working with businesses that have these ideas and showing how it can be accessible is super, super important um, in making some of those tweaks because we'd be better off for it. It's the same, it's, it's not uh, something that we haven't done. It's the same way with uh, citizens. Um, I make small tweaks in my lifestyle and impact because I want to, you know, sort of make a difference. Um, some of those are, are completely accessible to me because my perspective got changed out of a conversation with someone. And I said, hey, you know what, years ago, I decided to become uh, a vegan. And it's not something that I preach about or talk about, but it's something that I know consciously is definitely making an impact in a very small way to sustainable development um, for our planet. So I think that's the first. The second is... Um, you know, really looking at what uh, catalytic opportunities uh, exist for growth. Uh, we, we have lacked, I think, a growth mindset to support some of our entrepreneurs that are really thinking about uh, regenerative businesses, the, the game changers, our risk tolerance has to change. We are still, as much as we are entrepreneurial, we are still very risk averse. And so what I've tried to champion through the economic strategy and what I think a ton of companies small, medium, and large, uh, uh, and otherwise, 
are what are going to be the game changers and not losing or watering down some of that ambition. And they're most importantly, taking a credible path to get there. If we can highlight more of those stories about those that are, are aiming for the game changers, not just within Calgary, but around the world and have a credible path to get there, if we hear more about that, if they align, uh, if we align ourselves uh, from an economic strategy perspective to bring those into the fold, those are in creative industries. Those are in small business. Those are in startups um, that you're quite familiar with. That is, I think, more of the story we need to hear versus convincing some of the largest employers who are shareholder driven, who don't hold a lot of the, the decision making authority to all of a sudden make radical changes. I, I don't think that that's going to be tenable. Yeah, and my follow-up question is, I guess that you alluded it to it. So I think the energy sector, um, the shift that we're having for, through the just transition and other types of ways that the energy sector is, is, is moving. We actually, you talked about people exiting their jobs. <coughs> um, it seems to me that a lot of those people who are transitioning out of the energy sector, either because they lost their job or because they're disheartened or changes are happening that are relevant to them for, for moving out. But now we have a, a quite a large population of people who have financial resources to start their own businesses. And how do you think that ties into uh, sort of this new economy that we're moving into? Uh, absolutely a huge, huge tie-in. And, and again, this is, this is something that we're, we're sort of paying attention to now because there's a, a very distinct focus on uh, our economy, the sustained downturn, the structural uh, challenge in our energy sector um, and, and the changes being made there. But this has happened through periods of boom and bust all the time, uh, whether you're in an energy sector or commodity driven economy or not. You know, the amount of people, uh, you know, when I announced publicly that I was uh, leaving my role uh, and taking 2021 off to, to work on my research and, and be a full time dad, the amount of uh, people who called me and said, you know, chatted about the decision that they made to stay home with their kids, but many of them. Uh, actually made that choice because they'd actually been laid off or they'd left their, their job. You know, they said they spent some time with their kids. It really allowed them the, the space to think. And then they went out and started their business or a venture capital firm. And these are people that are incredibly successful today. Um, I think we need to make the skill sets of entrepreneurialism uh, much more accessible. There's a reason why the economic strategy, which I still believe in to this day, I wouldn't have committed my, my name to it otherwise has entrepreneurial uh, uh, spirit and entrepreneurship at the heart of what we needed to do. We need to do, and that's not just you know for-profit private enterprise. That's not for profit. That's across all different dimensions. Uh, and I think it's important that we recognize. You know, Steve mentioned earlier the importance of education. We are one of the only provinces in Confederation to have entrepreneurial spirit and entrepreneurial thinking embedded within our curriculum framework. I don't know how often we we adhere to it uh, as closely as we should. So you, you're doing some of the frontline work on this. A ton of other partners uh, are trying to make this as accessible as possible, but I actually think we're going to rely on it. I see, I see my friend Madison is, is on the call too. This is a, the definition of someone who's entrepreneurial and doing great things for her city. So uh, we need more of that and, and fast for sure. Thanks for coming on, Lori, and thanks for all the great work you do. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, so as, as Jason was able to spot there, our next panelist is Madison Savalo, who's Chief of Staff for Carbon Upcycling Technologies, doing really interesting and critically important work on converting CO2 into usable consumer pro products. Um, really, really neat and interesting stuff. And a relatively new Climate Hub member. Uh, we just keep getting all these smart new members in here. It's, it just seems like seems like that's the flow right now, and we want you. So, uh, so you know, check out CalgaryClimateHub.ca and, uh, and and come and join the join in the fun and the, the good work. There she is. Thanks for coming on, Madison. Hi, thanks for having me on. And Jason, it's good to see you. I know the the Shapers Hub really misses you, but <laughs> yeah, good to see you're doing well. Um, yeah, I'll just jump into my. My first question there. Um, I'd love to hear this, hear all this talk about Alberta and Calgary being a world leader in the energy transition. And I'm wondering how strong a role should policy and government play in supporting clean tech moving forward? Whether that's, you know, carbon incentives, things like that, grants. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, and tell everyone in the uh, Shapers Hub, I'll, I'll see them uh, very, very soon, actually. 
uh, as I as I wade back into some of my community responsibilities. Uh, look, I, I think uh, government has has a critical role to play, uh, but I would say no more than than any other um, a sort of power broker here. Um, part of the challenge, I think. Uh, has been the uh, over-reliance uh, for, for quite some time on government um, to be able to solve some of these challenges. And I think once you become uh, either beholden or reliant on some of those uh, government incentives, depending on the nature and scale of your enterprise, the more challenging uh, it can be for, for innovation growth. Um, uh, we've seen that, that play out largely within the, within the tech sector. Now, that being said, the, the role of government, particularly in, in Calgary and Alberta, I think is, is one that is, should be responsive to the market. You know, what I've uh, dealt with over the last couple of years is advocacy for particular sectors where we just cannot compete because of incentives being offered by other jurisdictions or, or favorable policies towards sectors or businesses um, um, in those sectors. And so that's, that's, that's just pragmatic you know, business and, and policy uh, meat and potatoes. That is not ideological about the role of government and, and all of these other things. That's saying, hey, we have world-class, um, you know, natural skylines and beautiful uh, scenery in say uh, the creative industries for film and television. We have some of the best talented workers, um, but we have a cap up to 10 million on terms of tax credits on what we can rebate. Uh, most of the decisions about film and television are made by financiers, not by directors, unless your name ends in Spielberg or Scorsese or in Yuritu. And you know what? That's how uh, some of these you know, productions end up going to these remote locations rather than in Alberta because the incentive is higher. Uh, or why folks are out of work in Alberta midway through the year and then track on to BC where there's a more favorable incentive. The same thing happens within tech. The same thing happens within climate. Now, very long-winded way of saying the very unique, um, I think, opportunity for clean tech, in particular, is its alignment with some of the frameworks that we have through the new federal budget, um, not necessarily through the provincial budget that was released today, which is more stay the course, but in future budget conversations around aligning our incentives to the net zero framework. We now have the guideline. We now have cooperation amongst uh, Canada and the US, which is uh, provides a certain level of certainty, not to double dip on the word certain. Um, but if we don't have thoughtful uh, policies, incentives, or programming that aligns towards that vision, and we see orders of government misaligned for whatever reason, it's not going to be successful. So yes, if we've already committed at a particular level, federally, provincially, and certainly as a city, around a number of, of features that lead to uh, investments in climate resiliency, support for clean tech innovation, et cetera, it's important that I think the policies, the tax credits, the incentives map towards that, because if not, you're stifling some of the success of that overarching policy. And I don't think agree or disagree, anyone wants to see um, previously rolled out funds and programs uh, fall flat on their face just because of government misalignment. Awesome, no, that's that's great. Um, the next question I had, was, it's very much a change from the rest of this conversation, mostly around you know innovation and energy transition, things like that. But I'm really curious to get your thoughts on the 15 minute city model that a lot of cities are trying to take on and um, specifically for Calgary, which is such a sprawling city. city. And I know um, earlier this year, there was some talk within the city that you know voted against expanding the city for 11 new districts. Um, so yeah, just curious about your thoughts on how that can be a portion of tackling climate change as well? Yeah, no, uh, another great question. Look, I, I think that um, the 15 minute city is a, is a compelling model. It's got, you know, thoughtful urbanist practices when you layer on um, uh, the, the, the concept of donut e economics on top of that, uh, it, it becomes uh, increasingly more compelling and I'll, I'll be paying close attention to, to Paris and other jurisdictions mm -hmm. that are trying to implement it. The challenge with, with Calgary is we got to dance with the one that brung us and we have what we have and what we have is beautiful, what we have is imperfect, what we have is complex. Uh, we, we can't put the toothpaste back uh, in the tube and I think that's what I said to, to Bentley earlier around, you know, if we took some very radical approaches to, to land use planning, maybe we could put a dent in some of this, but, but the sticky situation we have is, you know, we're largely overbuilt. Um, you know, property tax uh, revenues from downtown have largely funded a lot of the services that we have. Um, we have to get used to a new norm where that's not the case. And then the other one that doesn't get a lot of attention um, 
uh, and I've you know publicly spoken out against uh, the investment in the 14 new communities and largely the 11 that were eventually turned down because I think it's just unsustainable fiscally to be able to do. But the through line that I do uh, empathize with or understand is those communities that are being built on the periphery of the city are being built with some of the most thoughtful urban urbanist practices, 15 minute city mentality that you could find. They are sticky places. They, they have mixed use development. They have energy efficiency. Uh, the challenge is, is that they're just keeping people on the periphery of the city. So while in the macroeconomic perspective, it's certainly unsustainable. Uh, it's, it's not going to pay for itself. It's growth that uh, upon growth that was not necessarily needed in terms of building out instead of building up. The challenge is, is that it's being built really well. And I, I think we have to acknowledge that and not denigrate it. We have to think about the, the, the quandary we find ourselves in. And like I said, I, I stated publicly on the record in the paper and, and in other forums at the time, I, I don't think it was a responsible thing to do. I don't think it'll be a responsible thing going forward. I'm heartened that they, they made different choices, but we really have to take, you know, whether it's under the 15 minute city banner just take the macro principles from that or meso principles, if you will, and just apply them. Do we want to have choice and freedom in our city, which might align with the sort of rhetoric in Alberta that might fly anyways, to walk, to, to shop, to, to bike, to do all these other things without any other uh, ideologi uh, ideological agenda. We just like choice and freedom in the market. And that's how we want to build and, and encourage people to build. Great. Let's start doing that, uh, particularly within our downtown that, that I think certainly needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, Madison, and thanks for the great work you're doing with the Hub. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You bet. Um, you know what? I've got a question or two left there, Jason. I always try to, to hone it in at about an hour, but, uh, you know, sometimes we go a little bit over. I hope that's okay with you. I know you're a new sure. dad. <clears throat> Don't worry, he's uh, he's uh, he's already fast uh, asleep. So, uh, dad's uh, dad's out for the night. He can he can All do. All right, fair enough, fair enough. Um, okay, so the other question that that I feel like I want to brush on really briefly just is that, you know, we do have an election coming up in Calgary. Um, the the Calgary Chamber of Commerce uh, around the tech when tech decided to pull out of the deal here. Uh, expressed uh, wishes for for a climate plan, and um, that was a, a new 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 as far as my experience from that particular organization. And uh, so, I guess my question is, how can we make sure that a transition or a just recovery is on the ballot uh, and in the debate halls? How do we make it? How do we make it so that this this be, this is something that people are talking about during this election? Uh, very simple in, in, in my mind. And it's, I think people are going to hate this answer, but I just, I just see no way around it. And it's, it's to have, um, and I'm not putting pressure on, on your organization, but I think it's, it's going to be incumbent upon organizations that want to see this on the ballot or, or just, you know, concerned uh, citizens or, or ones that recognize, you know, both the opportunity and challenges posed by, by climate change is to consult. Uh, there's, there's, there's no point in putting something on the ballot or cajoling the candidate that you want um, so that they hope that they can get in just to potentially be let down once uh, the complexity of a decision um, is, is put upon them. I, I, that, that model of governance is unsustainable. We already have the scars to, to prove it. If, you're, if your faith is, is, is placed in, in one single person to make the decision you want at a time years out, uh, particularly in the field of politics, I don't have a lot of faith in that process. So uh, the, the, the one thing that, that people can do is, is consult, is to, if you're an organization, just like we did uh, when I was curator of Global Shapers Calgary, we partnered uh, with Madison's help and, and uh, Robin from, from Global Shapers and, and a number of others um, to put on a, a, a federal debate, uh, had all the parties, uh, I believe all the parties, maybe except for one represented there, uh, and we're able to ask thoughtful questions. And I, and I thought it was a very, very productive conversation. The next step has to be not only consulting with the candidates, but consulting with the people that are gonna be impacted. The, 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 the call to action or the challenge that I have right now is that when we invoke just transition or just recovery or any of these other things, uh, depending on who you talk to, you get a different answer of what it is or what it looks like or how you define it. Right. You know, are we talking about the UN's approach, which is the just transition mechanism where they've deployed 
actual investment capital to, de to be deployed in three different streams, uh, geared towards uh, citizens, geared towards uh, the private sector, leveraged with other financing uh, models and orders of government? Uh, or are we talking about uh, rhetoric, um, which can be you know, easily weaponized or misinterpreted? It's the same thing that goes for the Green New Deal. I've seen announcement after announcement, uh, and it was part of, you know, it was not necessarily uh, part of my role at, at Calgary Economic Development or related to the economic strategy, but it was a responsibility that I felt in my chair to communicate to people where all the pieces are fitting together, where all these announcements come up. But if you believe in a Green New Deal, and you look at the federal budget and a number of the other announcements that have come, you know, either through the Alberta Ecotrust Foundation, uh, who I know is a sponsor, uh, or, or uh, an, another order of government around uh, energy retrofits, uh, clean buildings, uh, a number of other efficiency measures. That's part of what, you know, my understanding is a Green New Deal calls for. I didn't see anyone connecting the dots and say, what a great uh, announcement or what a great deployment of capital to be able to, 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 to move our, our city forward or economy forward in terms of a transition or any new deal. So, so I think we need, this is the time to get credible. This is the time to get pointed and, and, and make sure, and maybe I'm taking the opposite uh, tact of, of what uh, uh, Meslin, who I've, I've spoken to a couple times in Calgary, uh, said in the last episode, which is look, the power of hashtags. Uh, yeah, there's, there's power in it, um, but I don't know when it comes to policy uh, and the actual decisions that improve the lives of people, um, uh, whether that, that leads to the outcomes we want. It can certainly get on a ballot. It can certainly get a candidate elected or not. I don't know that it has the efficacy in the actual decisions we need to make right now at a time where we need to get this right. Uh, we won't get another do-over. If I don't see something in front of me as a decision maker that's credible, doesn't necessarily need to be totally costed, but at least a framework, uh, I, I don't know that it's deserving of the kind of attention um, that we would expect any other senior leader decision maker, let alone political authority uh, to go off on or deploy millions of dollars of capital. Now's the time to get really, really credible on consultation and that policy frameworks. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'll put it in, in the terms of innovation. I, I think you're right to, to, to talk about it the way you do. I, I feel like we're missing the whole product development. You know, like we're, we're passing around catchphrases like a just transition. But if I try to explain to my, my, my brother or my dad or whomever what exactly that is, I can make the right sounds. But, you know, if, if he wants to pass that to his money guy, I have nothing. And uh, until we have that whole product development, we're not going to get that middle of the curve, right? Um, yeah, and, 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 and I'll, I'll say there are choices to be made. It's not, it's not esoteric. It's, it's not completely theoretical. Jurisdictions have moved forward with this. And, and yeah. what I think we need from the, the community or concerned parties that want to see action on this file is to get a little bit uh, definitive, not overly rigid, um, but certainly adaptive in saying this is what it could look like and this is what it would include. We've, we've seen uh, the deployment of fiscal capacity at all orders of government. So we know that there's money that has been earmarked to deal with, say, the public health pandemic. Um, that we, we can forecast what it might cost to do some of these things and which order of government is largely responsible for it or not. And, and then I think uh, approach elections or the like um, with, with, I think, a level of certainty or at least a framework to have that conversation. And because uh, if you don't, you end up, I think, with the, in the situation you're in with your, your old man is, is knowing that you're passionate about it, knowing that you care about it, but not necessarily knowing how to how to move the the wheels forward on the product development side to be able to make it uh, tangible and, and and just very quickly the last thing I'll say is we need to remember that there are going to be different signals uh, and perspective shifts that matter to different people. Uh, I mentioned to you when we chatted earlier, um, you know, there are communities uh, in Calgary that for years have have measured uh, job growth or or job attractiveness by signals of wealth. We still have you know, some of the highest income levels in the entire country, even with sustained unemployment. You know, I have a good friend who's uh, in the business of renewables, a uh, great company making a good amount of money. And he has an electric vehicle and it's by a brand name uh, sort of uh, car maker. And he says, I park it on the driveway. Uh, and I just said, okay. And I just kind of carried on with our conversation. He said, do you, do you wanna know why I park it on the driveway? And I said, sure. And he said, because I want people to know there's money in renewables. I want to send a signal across all the people that I know who live in my community uh, uh, that, that worked in, in the energy sector and oil and gas, that there's wealth here. 
And I'm not going to judge that signal that's being sent of saying, hey, maybe that's what changes someone's mind on renewables is the fancy car in the driveway, not, you know, the, the climate strikes or others that I think, again, are incredibly important. What we need, again, I'll remind you of what I said earlier, a big tent. Big yep. tents are the movements that I'm into. Everything from uh, the strikes that are happening on, on Fridays, and I know your, your co-chair has done a lot of great work and his, his, his daughter, and I, I very, very much admire the commitment to this issue, all the way to some of the more transactional things of you know, relying on catching that glimpse of that you know, fancy EV or you know, our former premier, Peter Lahey, who have a great amount of admiration for flying over in a helicopter one day and looking out and saying, whoa, we, we need responsible uh, and sustainable growth development. Maybe if that helicopter ride didn't happen, he wouldn't have spoken out at the time that he did. We need mm -hmm. to think of all of these different perspective changers leading towards any election and in the years to come. Sounds good. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on, Jason. I really enjoyed our chat tonight. Um, it, actually, before, before I uh, go into my final spiel, is there anything else you'd like to get a, communicate to our audience or did we, did we cover it? No, I, I think we've, we've, uh, we've, we've covered a fair bit. I just want to thank uh, you uh, and the team of the Calgary Climate Hub for uh, the invitation, for the thoughtful questions from, from Lori and Madison. Uh, and to all of the folks that have committed just countless hours of advocacy, of volunteerism, um, to be able to, uh, I think, wrestle with some of these issues that are, are in need of discussion. It's been a privilege to, to chat with you guys today and uh, look forward to, to partnering with the Calgary Climate Hub in the future uh, on, on any initiatives that, uh, that, that matter to Calgarians and, and Albertans. So thank you once again. You know, we may want you to come in and uh, join us on one, maybe our elections note or something. Well, I'll reach out to you. Um, Feel free. Yeah. Once again, thanks for coming coming in. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, before we go, I'll reiterate: we're immensely grateful for the support of the Alberta Eco Trust for this broadcast. I should say a few words about the Calgary Climate Hub as well. Um, if climate is something that is important to you is something that that you you feel and especially if it's if you've got the smoky skies out there or you, you know you've got anxiety about the future i urge you for your own well-being to find yourself a calgary climate hub and if you're you're in calgary this is you've, you've got it right here you there's there's nothing quite like going and sitting around a table with a bunch of smart people that are looking at legitimately moving the ball on climate at the municipal level, at the community level, and, and whichever levels we can find. Uh, it, Joan Baez uh, once said that the antidote to despair is action. And, uh, you know, so I would recommend that uh, you join the Calgary Climate Hub. And if, if, you, uh, if, you, if you don't have the time, but you've got a few extra bucks, uh, it's a tough dollar, the climate dollar in this city, and it shouldn't be. Um, and we can we can always use the help. We we need the help. Um, so consider uh, donating to the hub, volunteering to the hub. But again, if you care about climate, you need you want to be a part of this thing. Um, beyond that, as I mentioned, our next climate of change episode. My mind is blown. It's Dr. Michael E. Mann, world famous climate scientist and author. March 24th at 6.30 p.m. RSVP in the chat, calgaryclimatehub.ca. You might want to sign up for that sooner rather than later. Only got so many spots in the Zoom call. Uh, I want to thank my producer, Shay Rogers, for all the great work she does. And I also want to thank Jesse Bartlett, who's been populating the chat. Daniela, who, uh, who has been um, putting out the word on Twitter and creating graphics and stuff. And there's a bunch of other great folks that help me do this, what I think is important work. Um, so thanks to all of you. And uh, beyond that, I want to thank you, the viewer, for giving us your time tonight and, uh, and showing up to listen to uh, me and Jason talk about the challenges the city faces. Um, good night for now, and let's get to work. Thanks again, Jason.